Hello everyone, here we start a new series on phase equilibrium. The fundamental concepts of phase, phase transition, the thermodynamic phase rule and the application of phase rule on various solid liquid and liquid liquid systems will be discussed here. We will see one component and two component systems separately and I hope the undergraduate chemistry students benefit this. Okay, we move on to the lecture series. So in this part, we will see some introductory terms and definitions which help us to understand the phase equilibrium in detail. So to start with, we will see what is a phase. A phase is a form of matter that is uniform throughout both in terms of chemical composition and in physical state. We will see this definition through some examples. Here consider this beaker full of water. Here you've got one phase of water. And now here some type of solid suspended in water like your mud suspension. I said suspended. Okay, this is important, the word suspension. Here the liquid form the first phase and the suspended solid form the second phase. And in the third example, you have got two different solids suspended in water. So the water forms the first phase and the two different solids separately form individual phases. And here you have got a mixture of two different solids like salt and pepper together. You get there is a phase of salt and another phase of pepper. And considering two immiscible liquids together, a mixture of two immiscible liquids like oil and water. You have got a phase constituted by the first liquid and the second phase constituted by the second liquid. So this is how I hope with this you see what is a phase. And with another example we can clearly see that here you have got a pure solvent and one of the solute is dissolving into the solvent and in the third case you have got two different solutes dissolving in this uh, solvent. In all the three cases I would say the system is constituting single phase because in all the three even in the case the third case where you have got two different solutes dissolved in the solvent the system is homogeneous throughout both in terms of chemical composition and in physical state. So with that I hope the term phase is clear and you can have the three different physical states like solids, liquids and gases. The three different physical states constitute different phases and different kinds of solids like our mixture of salt and pepper together. They constitute different phases. And different forms of solids like allotropes. Here you see charcoal, graphite and diamond. These three are allotropes of the same substance carbon. These three types of solid phases. They constitute different phases. And another example would be polymorphs. For example here calcite and aragonite are the polymorphic forms of the same calcium carbonate. They constitute different phases because they can be represented by different crystallographic structures. So this is how you distinguish phases. The phases are different for different physical states and for different solids and different solid phase that is for different allotropes and different polymorphs. And now with there we will see the technical definition of phase. A phase is a homogeneous, physically distinct part of a system with a clear boundary and is mechanically separable from the rest. Consider the case of salt and pepper mixture. Here, salt form one phase and the pepper form the second phase. Each is homogeneous within and each is physically distinct from the second one and has good clear boundary and can be mechanically separated. So this is how you understand what is a phase and consider a reaction vessel having calcium carbonate undergoing thermal degradation. Here the solid calcium carbonate is undergoing thermal degradation to get your solid calcium oxide and gaseous carbon dioxide. Here this system constitutes I would say three phases. The first one solid calcium carbonate, second solid calcium oxide and a third carbon dioxide phase. And now we move on to the definition of component. A component is a chemically independent constituent of a system. 
Here in this example, we can see there are three phases, a liquid phase and a solid phase and an unseen vapor phases over the liquid. Always the liquid is undergoing certain degree of vaporization. So you have got a vapor phase associated on the surface of every liquid and to certain extent on the solids too. So there are three different phases. But all the three phases constitute the same chemical entity which is water that is H2O. That is why this has got only one component. Although there are three phases, all the three phases constitute a single component that is water. And another example, if you have got a mixture of coal, graphite and diamond, these three allotropes form three different phases but they are represented by a single component called carbon. So there is only one component in the system. And our previous example of therm thermal degradation of calcium carbonate, you have got three different components. Calcium carbonate is one chemical entity forming one phase. Calcium oxide is a second chemical entity, second component and it forms a separate phase from the previous one. And calcium carbon dioxide is the third chemical entity and form a separate gaseous phase. So you have got three different phases here in and three different components. That's how you can technically define the number of components as the minimum number of independent species necessary to define the chemical composition of all phases of the system. And now we will see phase transition between different phases. Phase transition is a spontaneous conversion of one phase to another at a given or characteristic temperature. Consider water, our familiar example. Water has got three physical, different physical states, which are three different physical, sorry, phases. Water vapor phase, liquid phase and solid phase like this. You know that there are conversions between all these different phases possible. That is, liquid water can be converted to vapor water through a process called evaporation. And you know evaporation occurs at a given pressure. Evaporation is characterized at a certain temperature. We call it boiling point. And likewise, the vapor water can be converted back to liquid water in a process called condensation. So this conversion of phases from vapor to liquid is called condensation. Or this phase transition process is called condensation. And in a similar way, you've got liquid water undergoing freezing to form solid phase. So the phase transition from liquid to solid is called freezing. And also at a given pressure, this freezing is characterized by a particular temperature that is called freezing point. And the return back, that is solid to liquid conversion occurs in a process called melting by a melting temperature. Likewise, solid to vapor phase conversion occurs through sublimation and the reverse is called deposition. So the, all this processes are phase transition processes that is one phase is converted to another phase and at a given pressure each phase transition is characterized by certain temperature and that is called phase transition temperature generally and for freezing we call it freezing point and for melting it is melting point etc. Another kind of phase transition can be transition from one crystalline phase to another crystalline phase. One solid form of the substance to another solid form. For example, conversion of a rhombic form of sulfur to monoclinic sulfur. Rhombic and monoclinic are two different crystalline forms of sulfur. And conversion of rhombic form into monoclinic form occurs at a characteristic temperature of 96.5 degrees. And that's why the phase transition temperature of this process, this conversion is 96.5 degrees. So that's about phase transition, transition from one phase to another occurring at a characteristic temperature. And now how to detect phase transition? That is through a cooling curve. That is a representation, a graphical representation of time temperature dependence. And through this cooling curve, we obtain phase transition. As an example, let's consider liquid water at high temperatures. And if you now bring this high temperature liquid water to ambient condition and wait for some time, as time passes, you can see the temperature drops down. And certain point, at certain temperature, you can see the solid phase starts appear. And still, the liquid phase is there. And if you further wait for a while, you can see that 
after a while the liquid phase completely disappeared and what you have is only solid phase and after the complete disappearance of the liquid you see cooling again the temperature drops down between the two cooling parts or temperature falling parts you've got a flat point and this flat part of the cooling curve gives you the transition temperature this characterizes the transition of the liquid water to solid water and the complete transition occurs in a while characterized by this flat part and this flat part gives the transition temperature this is how we man normally measure the cooling curve and these days cooling curves are constructed by advanced thermal analytical instrument called differential scanning calorimeter okay now we move on to the thermodynamic aspects of phase equilibrium you know according to the second law of thermodynamics you will see the details of second law of thermodynamics in my thermodynamic lecture series please you may refer to that one of the deductions of second law was that at equilibrium chemical potential of a substance is same throughout the sample irrespective of the number of phases present there is considering here water having liquid water and over that you have got vapor water i just represented the molecules of water in liquid and vapor phases with some blue dots here and in whatever phases they are they are characterized by same chemical potential i hope you know what is chemical potential that is the partial molar free energy represented by mu and you may see this in my again in my thermodynamics lecture series and consider mu1 and mu2 are the chemical potentials of water molecule in the two phases the liquid phase and the gaseous phase respectively then a small amount of liquid phase is now transferred or converted to vapor phase like this so the liquid part now is suffering by a loss of dn amount of molecules and the vapor phase is now added by dn molecules obviously their free energies change from the previous value the new free energy is the old free energy the previous free energy minus this mu1 dn because mu1 is the chemical potential and dn is the small amount of substance transferred or the phase the liquid phase lost that amount of substance that's why you have put a negative dn here and as we have got only one component you can say this is mu1 dn gives you the free energy component and in the vapor phase again during the same procedure the vapor phase free energy also changes it has got added by the dn component with the mu2 the chemical potential and the net change in free energy would be given like this that is dg would be the difference between the g2 and g1 so you end up in this condition that at equilibrium you know the free energy changes is zero and so you you reach the condition that mu1 equals mu2 that is the chemical potentials are same for the component for given component in all the phases this forms the thermodynamic criterion for phase equilibrium so whatever the phase they exist the chemical potential for a given component is same throughout all the phases this is the thermodynamic criterion of phase equilibrium now we move on to phase diagram phase diagram is a physical a representation of physical changes of phases in a graphical way and this phase changes are described in terms of selected intensive properties and normally we use phase diagram we show phase diagram in terms of temperature and pressure these are the generally selected intensive properties used to describe phase transitions and we will see the details or the examples of phase diagram soon and there is another important parameter called degrees of freedom degrees of freedom is the minimum number of intensive variables described to used to describe a system at any point of phase transition so the phase transition is described with the help of certain intensive variable what happens when, to this variable when the system undergoes transition from this phase to the other phase this is what is described in a phase diagram so you need a certain number of variables to describe the system at a certain point of phase transition or phase equilibrium 
and this minimum number of variables is called degrees of freedom. And different variables that may describe a system are obviously temperature and pressure. As this temperature and pressure will deduce, will help us to deduce the volume information. You don't need the volume information as a necessary criterion uh, parameter, but you, you just need temperature and pressure. And we need composition. If it is more than one component system, you need composition. You need to know the relative amount of each of the components. And we need chemical potential. So these are the four sets of parameters that are related or that are able to describe the system. And now we will deduce how many of such, how many are minimum number of variables can describe our system. So temperature constitute one of the parameter, one of the variable. Pressure will be another variable. So one temperature value would be there, one pressure value would be there. And we will see how many composition values we require essentially to describe the system. For C components, we normally express the composition value in terms of mole fraction. So for C components, we just need the composition of C minus 1 components because then the last component composition is obvious from the rest. So for C components, we have got C minus 1 compositions in each phases. And for P phases, we need P times C minus 1 composition values. So in total, we need P times C minus 1 composition values to describe the system. And now we move on to see how many chemical potential values are related to the system. So here you've got this many equations like writing the thermodynamic condition for phase equilibrium. The chemical potential of first component in the first phase equals the chemical potential of first component in the second phase. In another equation you can write chemical potential of the first component in the second phase equals chemical potential of the first component in the third phase. Like this, for P phases, you can write P minus 1 equations. And consider the second component. Very similar to the first component, you can write the equations, P minus 1 equations for the second component also. Like this, for every component, you can write P minus 1 equations each. So if you've got a total of C components, we will end up with C into P minus 1 equations for C components and P phases. Okay, but this C into P minus 1 equations and the this many number of variables provided by these equations are restricted variables because we, our condition, thermodynamic condition is that the system is in equilibrium. That means the chemical potential of a given component are the same throughout all the phases. So actually this C into P minus 1 chemical potential values, these are restricted variables. So you can subtract this many number from the total number of intensive variables that describe the system. So in total you have got the total degrees of freedom would be one temperature value like this, one pressure value, P times C minus 1 composition value and subtracted by the C, C times P minus 1 restricted variables which are the chemical potential values. So by solving you will reach this equation that if the degrees of freedom reaches equal to C minus P plus 1, this rule or this statement, this mathematical expression is called Gibbs phase rule. F is C minus P plus 2. F is the to total degrees of freedom. C is the number of components and P is the number of phases. And what we have seen so far in this part can be concluded here. Gibbs phase rule is given by this equation F is C minus P plus 2. F is the number of degrees of freedom, the minimum number of intensive variable required to describe a system at any point of phase transition is given by a combination of number of components. Component is a chemically independent constituent of the system and number of phases where each phase is a homogeneous physically distinct part of a system bounded by a surface and is mechanically separable. So, so far we have seen these definitions and the relation and we deduce this relation and we have seen what is a phase transition. Okay, so we are closing currently and with this background we will see in the next session uh, one component systems exemplified by water system and sulfur system. So, we have 
we will apply our background knowledge of phase equilibrium and phase rule on these different systems in the next session. Until then, thank you.